and Allah causes you to act in a debased manner right before you die, and causes him to act in a good manner. Right, with people, I always bring up the example of drug addiction because I think addiction is the perfect uh, metaphor or perfect uh, parable or whatever you want to call it for basically most everything in life, right? When you see a person who you, you, know, you call a dope fiend struggling with this, and I've, I've said this before, so there are those who've heard it, but I think you can't say it enough. When you see somebody struggling in this way, people, this is the essence of a person that people look down upon, right? But if you've never yourself struggled with that level of dependency, right, where the actual brain, in some cases with heroin, for example, I'm not to get graphic, but ceases to produce chemicals that make you feel good. Your brain stops producing the chemical that makes you feel good without this, this chemical substance. For you to struggle with that, if you haven't struggled with that, who are you to exalt yourself and say, well, I've never been a dope fiend? Well, you've never had that struggle. And it may be the blood that they that person with that, with that struggle for their whole life. And you feeling better than them, and at the last minute, when you experience something that hard, it might not be that. It might be a woman. It might be love. It might be uh, your anger. It might be whatever. You, it might be your self-delusion about your arrogance. You take around money and oppress people or something like that, right? Allah will show you from who you are, and on the day of judgment, people will see who you are and see who he was, right? Even though you committed all those sins, but Allah saves you with that. Allah knows best when you see the rest of the So when we look at other people, we are not the ones who have the right to praise ourselves. We are not the ones who have the right to judge other people, to exalt in what we've been given over other people, because that's only from Allah. He receives the praise for our station. If our vision is good, we have some lot of good to stay. Uh, it's basically just none of our business to be concerned about what somebody else should be. This is how it's should be. Well, oh, he's open, he should do this and this and X, Y, and Z. And this person, my wife, she's like this. She should do X, Y, and Z and change like this. And she needs, and this is the type of person she is, this is the type of person I am. You know, this person, you know, he got this station, he got this station. Always measuring and judging. It's none of your business. Let Allah do Allah's business. Let Allah praise himself. And you praise Allah, that is his business. Let Allah judge people, because he knows best how to judge. But leave that to the one whose business it is, because it's not ours. Our job is to deal with people as they are, convey the message, and deal with them in the best way possible, regardless, without making judgments about their state. That doesn't mean let people walk over you or nothing. It's just like, okay, I have to establish certain boundaries or certain limits or whatever. I'm going to do that in the best possible way, with the most rough that I can. I'm going to do my job with me, what I'm supposed to do, right? Have as much mercy as possible with this person, within reason, and keep it pushing. It's none of our business to always be worried about how somebody else is supposed to be. And our mother told me, and I always repeat this, you will be a lot happier in life this way. Specifically, she said you will be a lot, you will save you a lot of suffering in this life, she told me. Once you just accept, you cannot make anyone do anything they don't want to do. You cannot make anyone be guided. You cannot make anyone change their state. You don't even perceive correctly what their state is. Only Allah knows. So why are you wasting time to become upset? This is a source of a lot of us being upset and depressed. It's like always worried about well, this one is like this, and this one is like that, and I'm like this, and things need to be like that. Now, Allah decides how things are supposed to be. Allah knows what is in people's hearts. Mind your own business. Deal with ourselves. Um, the last kind of principle we'll end on in this section on what's related to this is um, an example of how much the opposite of kibber, how, how wary, how far from kibber we should, that our Rasul Allah, 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 Allah was is that when he was slandered, and the slander of the Prophet is extremely serious, it's not like the slander of us, right? It's different. In fact, in the Sharia, Abu Bakr actually said when a person slandered and insulted and did all stuff to him, and one of the Sahabas wanted to kill the man, he said that's not for anyone but the Prophet says The Prophet says something, and it may be the other Prophets, a lot of the best. But the Prophet says something, someone who's not a Prophet, a person is never killed, their life is never taken for what they say about you. Now, there may be some other consequences. You might not slide, but you cannot take life over it. The prophets of Allah, the life of the people is taken, is executed for speaking against the prophet, slaying the prophet. And when the prophets of Allah was slandered, this is not because, this is because of his status with Allah and how much Allah loves him. 
When he was slandered, even with that enormity, it's one of the most serious things that can be done. It's the most serious slander that can be done. He didn't even use to defend himself directly. Someone else used to handle it. So this is a good example of how uh, and the, uh, our teacher, I mean, was not being mentioned. This is because, partially because the act of defending oneself that can resemble killer, can resemble this praising of yourself. So when someone insults the Prophet you may have to come back and say, well, I'm not like this, I'm like this. And then state your, even though it's true, and it's true, anything he could have said praising himself short of deifying himself, all that would have been true of him, because he was a perfect man. But he didn't want to praise himself, right? So he would just ask someone else to handle it. And that doesn't mean uh, that it's it doesn't mean that it's uh, impermissible to respond, and it doesn't mean that the response that should be left unaddressed. But there's this principle, especially with people of a high station, that they don't necessarily, it's, it's kind of dislike to them to have to respond to that, even dignify that with a response, right? It's unbecoming for the lion to have to answer the dogs. Uh, which doesn't mean it went unaddressed, because when Ka'ab and Minash Malashma slandered the Prophet Sallallahu and incited the Quraysh against the Muslim, was putting out rap misses, making poetry, talking about the Muslims, specifically the last poem they did, interestingly, he was inciting people against the Muslims, insulting the Prophet, and in the last poem he made a reference to a, a, the physicality of a Muslim woman, right, to her body. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Masjid, instead of responding to himself, he said, who is ready to kill this cow for me? Who, who will handle me? I don't know if he said, who is ready to handle cow for me? And the Cobb's uh, foster brother was like, I'll do it. And a bunch of other guys were like, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it right now. Right? Even in that severe of a situation, though, the Prophet said some of them didn't directly respond. Right? But there was this need to address it because he was inciting people against the Muslims. Um, and so the last thing we're mentioned is that this also, our Amir mentioned, this is how we should be in general with someone above us. Like an old person shouldn't have to respond to some youngster insulting them when there are other young people around. If we hear somebody get in one of the gray hair elders themselves, they shouldn't have to get up out the chair and be like, y'all disrespect the young people these days. They shouldn't have to respond to that. The other young people should check that person hard. The other young people who are on his station, his own peers, should be like, huh, absolutely the heck not. No. And the same thing applies with our emirs and our shayuk. This is something that's important, right, for people who are in structured jamaats. That the amir, when Amir Mustafa, right, or one of our other Amir Hamza is around, we don't leave it to them to respond to those type of things. They shouldn't even have to. We should respond. And it's not because of their personality. It's not because of them. He, we might know, you might know your dad ain't all that as a person. We might know the Amir, Amir United, not all that as a person. Irrelevant. It's who he is to us at that moment. It's who Amir Hamza is to us. It's who Amir was, it's the position that he's holding, right? And if we allow people to diss our prophets, or diss our parents, or diss our years, then we're really just disrespecting ourselves. It's the ultimate show of weakness in the community when you see that the noble ones among them can be just dissed with no consequences. Or that the people being targeted have to stand up and defend themselves like they're on trial, right? You really take a group seriously and you'd be like, they spoke something about his leader, and they didn't, that, the brother didn't even respond. The whole community was just on him. Say something about Elijah Muhammad in a in, within any earshot of the nation. Say something about Elijah Muhammad in a more thinking question. Or even another question. Even among those who don't have, they may not even have illusions about him. But they still like, that's like practically our granddad. Even if they know certain things are true. Like, you're not going to speak on my granddad, not going to be. Uh, so again, this isn't about arrogance, it's not about personality, but it's about trying to put in place this kind of order, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, balance that we want to have. I say these words of Raja, I say Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah. 
So we can't go really in depth in some of these concepts, but again, I recommend the books. Usul al-Din, it's a very short one, there's a lot in it, just a, you know, two pages, a little less than two pages, kind of covering all of our Aqida. And another, the other main book we're drawing on is Udato Bayan, both by the Shaykh of Usman and Fodiyu. So Udato Bayan and Usul al-Din. Uh, one concept we'll just mention, without getting into it today, is something that is a higher level of pride, um, which we kind of lumped it in with pride, but it's technically different. Right, so pride is this exalting over oneself, over exalting yourself over others and praising yourself. Technically, when it gets to this next level, it's something else called virtue, virtue, conceit. Um, this is when basically not only you have this feeling or you sing these praises of yourself, but it's like this deep-seated feeling of being amazed and just incredibly impressed and blown away by yourself. Right, like somebody looks in the mirror and it's like, dang, I look good. Right? But it's this, it's this thing about their personality, right? But it's, it's to an extreme, right? Like you pray and you stand there praying like, man, I'm staying in super still. I hope everybody's looking at me, man, because they really think they learn. Not, not because I'm arrogant, because they can really learn from my, my shoe right now. You know what I mean? Alhamdulillah, Allah has really blessed me. Like, I'm on the Every day, this line is really magnet, but like, I'm on the Right? Feel it. There's this feeling of amazement. This feeling of, you see this, this is encouraged like, in our society. Like, people on social media, like, I came here from nothing. Like, I want to show you my car, it's my car, my million dollar car. Right? This is my chick. Like, I just look incredibly good. Like, and he said they have a sense of, like, euphoria. Like, they high on themselves, right? And not in the It's a way to be just happy and content, kind of high on I'm going to blah, blah, give me this. Like, I'm feeling my life. I'm good. With a sense of gratefulness, we're talking about urgent, this conceit. Right? This is about you, this isn't about Allah and what you give me. Um, and the job of the shaykh, or in the lack of, if you don't have a specific shaykh, then the job of the collectivity of the brotherhood, of all of us who are teach, kind of acting collectively as one big shaykh, help and teach each other as peers, is to destroy that. It's to destroy that culture. It's the opposite of what social media and social relations does now. Um, and again, one of the main reasons we can do this is remembering there are so many people we owe. So we have to cultivate that culture. We have a shade here, he would cultivate that culture with us. Say, don't talk about you, right? Let's talk, talk about all the people that you owe. Let's talk about who made me who I am, who made you who you are. Let's talk about our ancestors. Let's talk about all these things, right? To counteract that. So we have to create that culture as brothers, right? Just because the shade has gone, but we can just like fall off and let go and just like look for a shade. No, we all grown men. We're each going to pull as much of the weight as we can and work on this together. Um, so we have to constantly remind ourselves and remind each other and create this culture of reminders of all of the people that we owe and thanking them because thanking them is how we thank Allah. Not because of them, but because of Allah. Uh, and one thing we want to mention is that also, again, in starting down this path, we have to create this culture. We have the brothers kind of remind each other. And even that by directly being like a brother you in the area right now. We're just like, if we catch ourselves going into it, then let's do the opposite. You don't have to say something, so let's do the opposite. Let's remind each other of all these people we have to be grateful for. Um, <clears throat> and when people do manifest that, this extreme conceit and arrogance, uh, and someone is like kind of just out of control with it, it's that like you shouldn't even look at a person like that when they're doing that. Like you should avert your gaze. Like when you see a woman dressed like half legged and you're supposed to look down, when you see somebody flexing and just like with their car and trying to like attract your attention, the believer should be like, bro, that's embarrassing. I'm like, not gonna look right now. You know what I mean? This person should be prayed for, and when necessary, if it gets too much, check. They should be checked when it comes to the point where it starts to violate our others, not praise. And we see brethren of the law. So, you know, to address this issue, let's do the opposite. Let's remember all the means of Allah's blessings. There were women, this uh, text of Sula Deen is traditionally sung by women and young girls. Uh, in the, I've seen a video of all these young girls in Nigeria singing this text in uh, Hausa, in their own language. It's written originally in, in, uh, in Arabic, but they sing it in their own language to make it a means of memorizing. This was preserved over 200 years of women and children singing and teaching this in the household before it reached us. And it reached us in the prison system, right, predominantly. And then it went out to the streets from there. So we had, so without all of the women who sang this for 200 years prior to us, we don't even know if this would have reached us, right? 
Because again, the Arabic text, even maybe the Arabic text would have survived, but it was the singing of it in house though, in the language that people understood by these common people that made it, the people actually heard about it and became widely known and then known outside of Nigeria, right? Otherwise, it might have just been the scholars who knew about it and it would get lost in the library in a long time. Abdurrahman ibn Auf said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, I am Al Rahman, Al Rahman, and created the Rahman, and I named it after me. So the first thing, and we're going to make this the topic of the last part of Kutbah, inshallah, in this kind of hierarchy of people that we should remember, the first thing we need to remember is this Rahman. Because Allah said, I made the Rahman, and I named it after me. And Al Rahman, is the most made one of the most major of Allah's names mentioned at the beginning of every surah, right? And Allah's rahma, this attribute of His, outstrips His wrath. It's even more than His wrath, and His wrath is severe, and His punishment can be strict. And yet His rahma is more than that. And when He made this rahim, He named it after Himself. Rahim literally means, or colloquially means, the uterus, the actual womb of the woman. He said, I named it after me. I have drawn close one who has drawn it close, and have cut off one who has cut it off. Wallahi, a, man, a human being who doesn't have softness, who doesn't have humility, who doesn't have this kind of recognition of the enormity of the ties of the Rahim, of this manifestation of Allah's Rahim on the earth, is barely a human being. Because even some animals have that better than we do. And what characterizes us as humans is not present if you don't have the softness towards your mother. And a man is not a man who doesn't have this softness towards his mother, towards the Rahim. And towards womanhood and this motherly characteristic in general, even when he sees it in others, right? Uh, when I was a child, I remember hearing people say, you know, the childbirth is the jihad of women, right? And I thought that that was like many things. There are certain things that are like compensation. Like the, the woman, women can't make salat uh, during their periods, right? So, you know, some of them do extra liquor, extra other things to try to compensate, right? But it's not, it's really not like salat, honestly. It's not salat, it's salat. Like, you can't really top that. So I thought this, was, this is something that Allah kind of was saying to you, okay, well, because you can't do this, this lesser thing is kind of made like it's equal to it. Like, you're gonna get the rewards by being able to do that, but you can't really do the real thing. When you've seen it, then you recognize that no, this is something where people, life is being made and saved, and death is on the table for everyone involved. And she goes out without the risk. When men go out to jihad, they lose their temper, they, sh you know, they make accidents, they shoot through their enemy and kill a child, they make wrong judgments, go to war with the wrong people, blow the wrong person's head off, and then later be like, dang, that was a mistake, right? <laughs> Really, this is this war. Study the animals of war. Some of the Muslims fought each other even in the early days, made mistakes, right? When she does this, that doesn't happen. It's only something positive that she's populating the earth with more believers, right? And this is something that is actually akin to that. And we need to teach our children this. To not just think that this is something where like Allah is kind of doing like we do and giving lip service to our mothers and lip service to our women. Uh, you have to be like just a complete clown to deny this if, if you've seen it. You know, or a boy. Because when I was a boy, I didn't know. When you're a boy, you don't know. You can't comprehend it. When you're a man, you know. Uh, downplaying that or denying it or kind of being oppositional about the importance of mothers, feeling like they always have to speak up and say something every time someone says something about the importance of mothers or women or women in general. This is the most impotent unmanly and self-defeating act we can do. There are people who think that right, every time someone speaks up about the rights of women, we have to kind of counter and be like, well also you know about the man's position and all this, right? Which is all true. Why not speak up? Like just let it be what it is. It's then it's self-defeating. Because we need daughters who are going to be raised on this kind of reza, on this kind of pride, right? Because when they go out to become mothers, then they're like, I'm going to do jihad. That they have the same kind of wisdom. Our daughter have the same kind of pride about producing children that a man would have when he was going to war peaceably left. And you know all of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi you know, I'll repeat it. The one where the man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and said, right, if I carry my mother on my back to Hajj, 
and walk and to laugh and how was, I was like carrying her on my back. And then again, you guys talk about carrying your mom. Maybe your mom's mom was like, oh, I can carry my mom. Like, that's probably your mom's shape. We talk about the blistering heat of ouch in the desert, right? He said, would I have paid her back for what she did for me, for her, you know, her right for me? And he said, not even for one scream of labor. Mm. Not one scream. And there's usually a couple screams with every contraction. And sometimes it goes on for days. And sometimes the sister doesn't make it. How many sisters have died, shahat, shahid, have died as martyrs throughout history to bring into existence all these Muslims we have all over the world? We have to recognize that. We have to recognize that as jihad and what it is. This is something that's going to give us success in Shah uh, And so we have to remind our sisters there will be a time to be able to cook on the rights and status of Mother Jal and the men that are going to do that in Shah Allah. But Rasulullah mentioned mothers first. And he mentioned women first, so we also mentioned it first. And it can't be emphasized enough. And I say that Allah knows best and success is with Allah. We will never be a broken community as long as there are unbroken mother figures around us. That's something we've seen as I saw when I was young, where I had a father in my life when I was with that. But, you know, you see a community where the men are taken out. And this is where the law says and recognizes how this is a catastrophe. This is absolutely irreplaceable in our men, right? But I've also seen what upright sisters, upright mothers could do, even by themselves. Which they shouldn't have to. But the fact that well, what they can do is, is amazing. The fact that what they can do even without the men is amazing. And it gave me hope that even then they could raise up men like Amir Talker, who was the first Amir in Oprah. And anyone who knows him, right, knows that that man is a, is a, is a, is a, a, a jewel if you ever met him. This is his character and his composure. He's not the type of man that you like think, oh, the man's gonna have a bad in his life. You know, like, he doesn't even seem like that. His mother raised him, and he so used to mention that to us. Um, so we ask a lot, and again, this doesn't mean perfect. This doesn't mean our mothers are unscarred. Doesn't mean that they're undamaged. But it means that they're still standing. And we need to raise daughters who, again, they might not be perfect. They might, we might not be able to protect them from everything. But who are able, they're intact enough, and they're proud enough, and they're on this kind of status, this kind of isa, this kind of pride about who they are as women, right, as the daughters and the inheritors of Khadijah, as the inheritors of Maryam, as the inheritors of Hawa, alayhi salatu wasalam, that they still pass down that chain of Rahmah that Allah gave to them directly when he created them, right? And even with how with Adam, when he says, I cast my spirit into, uh, into the clay, right? He uses the same words. He said, I cast my the spirit, the ruh, into the soul, the womb of Maryam, alayhi salam. So that there was never a time that Allah created a creation by means of another creation so independently, where she just did it by herself. And Allah doesn't just do things meaninglessly just because. A lot of them have made a person, another person who was just like, made the clay in front of the Jews with them watching and cast the spirit and had to come alive. That would have been incredible. But he chose a woman, he chose Mariya Mani to be the, the vehicle of this. So this chain of Rahmah that is transmitted by them, that has to continue to be passed down unbroken. And as long as we do that, inshallah ta'ala, Allah will give us care and Allah will elevate us as a people. And we ask Allah to preserve our mothers and preserve our sisters, all of the mothers and all of the women and all of the daughters of this ummah. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa bil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adab al Our Lord, give us the good in this world and the hereafter and protect us from the torment of the fire. Ya Allah, show us the true as true and cause us to act on it, the false as false and cause us to avoid it. We look to an argument. Ya Allah, we seek refuge with you from anxiety and grief. Ya Allah, we seek refuge with you from inability and laziness, from stinginess and cowardice, and from being overcome by death and the oppression of men. Ya Allah, send blessings upon our Sayyid Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your servant, prophet, and messenger, the unlettered prophet and upon his family, companions, wives, descendants, and the people of his house.